So, welcome back everybody to another networking video. I know another networking video. We are finishing up NAT, at least this series of NAT. We've done lots of other stuff. Links in the show notes. But this time we're going to talk about something that's, well, we don't talk about too often in the NAT conversation, and that is stun and turn. So, before we get to stun and turn, let me ask you this question, right? All I did was copy the previous topology to the other side of the diagram. But here's what we've got, right? We've got a NAT router right here. And so we have this private address space on the inside of the NAT router. And we've got this other private address space on the inside of this NAT router. Now we think about this for a sec, right? These nodes on the inside over here could be using the same address space as the nodes on the other side of the topology. They are interconnected via the public address space, the internet, right? So you're over here, you're gaming, you're having a good time, and another person is over here, they're gaming, they're having a good time. In fact, you might be gaming together. Now we know how NAT works. These are private. You can't get to these without doing some port address translation without forwarding the ports on the inside. That's what we did with servers. Same thing over here. So if these are private and these are private, how do folks that are gaming or connecting to each other with some other device, how do they connect to each other? And the answer is that long before we can establish this conversation right here where you're going to somebody else's NAT box, or through somebody else's NAT box, you have to have a conversation with some kind of provider. And that is today very often handled by stun and turn servers. So that's our basic problem. How does NAT to NAT work? And imagine that you're also talking about 16 people playing the same game in the same server together. How does that work? Or more, right? Today we have lots more gamers that might be in a particular game. And I use games just as an example, but it could be a lot of other communications. So the questions that we're trying to answer, we know that we cannot connect to a node behind a NAT router directly. In fact, I'm going to use that quote or that statement to pull a quote from the actual RFCs we're going to look at here in a second. Here are examples of stun and turn messages that, that are actually used when we do this. So the whole idea is that how do we punch through NAT routers to get to the nodes behind there, and how do folks that are behind the NAT routers make requests out because they need a little help connecting to somebody else. Now the first one we're going to talk about is turn. So that's traversal using relays around NAT. Now you can see that if we look at the RFC number, 8656. This is up there in the RFC numbering scheme. So we're just in 9,000 right now. Now this has been an RFC that's been updated a number of times, but the latest update is February 2020. So very recent RFC. And here's what it says in the RFC, right? If a host is located behind a network address translation router or a NAT box, it can be impossible for that host to communicate directly with other hosts or peers in certain situations. And in the situation that we're talking about really is about getting to somebody else that's behind another NAT router. In these situations, it is necessary for the host to use the services of an intermediary node that acts as a communication relay. Now, if we use the examples of games, it could be that there is a game server out there in the public world and everybody connects to that public server. But there are lots of companies that don't want to run a whole bunch of servers that allow everybody to connect. So sometimes you connect to somebody else's gaming machine set up as sort of a server for that session. So the turn RFC, which is act, the long name of it is actually traversal using relays around NAT relay extensions for session traversal utilities for NAT. It's done. The idea is that this RFC defines a protocol called TURN that allows the host to control the operation of the relay and to exchange packets with its peers 
using the relay. So what actually ends up happening is you get bound to the outside address of all of the other NAT boxes. Now the cool thing about TURN is it differs from other relay protocols in that you can be connected to lots and lots of other peers or other clients. Now the one that we saw in all the packet capture was the stun messages, but they're interrelated. You saw the, the exchange in even that brief snippet that I showed you. So stun then, also a February 2020 RFC, provides a tool for dealing with network address translators. It provides a means for an endpoint to determine the IP address and port allocated by NAT that corresponds to the private address and port. So if you remember how NAT works, you have a client server connection that the inside or private node establishes and that punches through the NAT box on the way out. But that comes from the outside interface of the NAT box. So there's an outside IP address and port. And so when you're communicating with the outside world, the outside world believes that it's coming back to that IP address and port. So session traversal utilities for NAT, STUN, it, the whole point is to collect those outside IP addresses and ports, and that creates the mapping for the inside or private addresses. It also provides a, a way to keep that connection alive. So the RFC defines this request response transaction where you're establishing and then an indication where there's no, no generation. The only method, now the RFC is actually good size, but the only method that's actually defined in there is the thing called the binding. And the binding is what attaches a client to that connection. So you got a stun client, or the client that's behind the NAT box that becomes the stun client, and it, the binding is associated with that outside, outside connection. And then we keep that alive. So there's an awful lot in the RFC that describes the operation of that whole thing. All right, so now we're setting our phasers to stun. So that'll finish this NAT series. As I said, I've done lots of other NAT stuff and examples, but I wanted to touch on turn and stun because there's an awful lot of stun and turn servers out there in the world, whether you realize you were using them or not. And the whole point is traversal of network address translators and their tables to allow those private nodes to talk to each other when everybody's sitting behind the same set of NAT routers. I shouldn't say that. When everybody's sitting behind NAT routers all over the place and we have to figure out what those outside addresses are and the ports for the outside connections and we establish that binding. So, servers, bindings, and relays, oh my. Now, related to this is RFC 8839, Interactive Connectivity Establishment, which is a lot of times associated with real-time communication. Well, there we go. Hey, like and subscribe if I revealed a little bit more of the world to you and showed you that maybe there's a lot more to the picture than just how we set up a network address translator. Whether you're using STUN, turn or just straight up translation may your packets always reach their destinations